6.33 Spanish time. So let us know what time it is in other places in the world, the people who are watching us. Um, so let's learn a, a little bit uh, about Jane. So she's in Tarragona. She's told us that's in Spain. Um, she has worked in language assessment and education for more than 25 years. She trained as a it's primary actually more teacher. Than 30. It's actually more than 30, but I didn't want to say that. Yeah, so I'm being <laughs> honest. I'm, I'm, I'm older than I look. <laughs> and primary teaching was your first uh, your first job in education with primary, right, Jane? Yeah, um, but now was. you also work with it secondary and, and teacher training. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a teacher trainer and I also work at a university where I teach a subject called didactics. Okay, and you work on the CELTA, um, on Delta courses, on CLIL courses. Yeah. And um, if you search for Jane's name online, you'll see that she's a regular conference speaker on a, on a wide range of topics. But her uh, special interest tonight is something that she's, something that you've become really interested in, and that's how the brain works and how children... Uh, how students uh, learn languages. So we're ready to pass across to uh, Jane. Um, Jane, I'll be here if you need okay, me. Thank just, you. just shout, but we'll pass over to you and you can start sharing your screen now. We're really, really happy to have you here, Jane. Okay, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? How many times have you said that since we started teaching online? Can you see my screen? Are there, are there I can no, see it. Okay. No strange, no strange boxes, no strange images. Looks okay, perfect fabulous. to me. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, let's go. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, or good morning, wherever you are. My name's Jane, and I'm a teacher and teacher trainer. Uh, my speciality, if you can call it a speciality, is in primary school teaching and also language teaching. Here are my notes from earlier. I was quite confident before I arrived in front of my computer until I saw my colleagues, uh, that my two colleagues' um, contributions, I saw their sessions and they were absolutely fabulous. You can see if you look closely at my notes, I've actually written a lot of things on by hand because I learned such a lot, especially in the last session, which is slightly connected to mine. So before I begin, I'd like to make it very clear, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a cognitive psychologist, and I'm definitely not a neuroscientist. What I am is a teacher trainer and a primary school teacher. I first became interested in neuromyths when I started to teach a university subject to new primary school teachers called didactics, which is quite an unusual name, of, name for a subject. Basically, it's about the art or science of teaching. I'm not a scientist, remember, I'm really not. Um, but the more I started to research when I had to start to prepare my classes on didactics or didactica, the more I became aware of the fact that some of the stuff I'd learned when I was training to be a primary school teacher wasn't actually true anymore, if it had ever been true. Okay, some things to think about there. Can you look at my screen? What is a neuromyth? Um, would you like to think about, look at that question for a moment, and please use, your, use the chat box. Can you give me a definition? What's a Euromyth? Any ideas? Okay, you don't, need a diff, you don't need a dictionary definition, just do you have any idea what a Euromyth is or what it isn't? Okay, okay. Oh, I'm seeing some really interesting things in the chat box. Learning slows with age. Something that's commonly believed about the brain and its functions that isn't really true. An untrue view of fact about someone's brain. Connecting the dots. Stereotypes about the brain. Really interesting. Okay, great. I'm going to show... Ah, we think we use 10% of our brains. That's something we're actually going to talk about in a moment. Myths about neuro neurodiverse individuals. Those of you who saw Claire's session earlier will have learned a lot about that. Let me show you my definition or rather the definition I prefer. Now, we don't know very much about how the brain works, but one thing we do know about 
how the brain works and students learn is that when a teacher reads aloud from the white whiteboard to a group of students, it doesn't mean that learning's taking place. So I was a primary school teacher, I was used to being the boss and I was used to reading aloud from my whiteboard or blackboard and in those days, I was used to doing all the talking. And then I did a lot of research and discovered that actually the sound of my voice reading things aloud from the board can actually interfere with children's learning. So what I'm gonna do is give you a moment to read the screen. If I let you leave the, read the screen and make your own decisions about the information on my screen or my whiteboard, it hopefully engages the cognitive wheels a little bit more and you will actually absorb and engage a little bit more with the subject. So what's a neuromyth? Okay, as I say, I'm not a neuroscientist, but neuromyths are generally accepted to be an unscientific claim about how the brain works, about brain function. Basically, it's an oversimplification. What I'd like to do in this session is look at three very basic neuromyths and think about how, by endorsing these neuromyths, it might affect our teaching and therefore our students' learning. So neuromyths, are they half-truths? Are they harmless? Or could it be potentially more dangerous for our children? A lot of the research I'm going to quote is from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And these, this is the organization that's doing all the work at the moment, that's doing all the new research on brain function and cognition. So you'll see this, um, you'll, 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 you'll see the initials OECD appear quite a lot in this session. In the handout at the end, you'll also find some really interesting links to their studies. And basically that's where I've learned a lot of my information from. So separating the brain from speculation. I like that. I think it gives a, a kernel of truth to what we're doing. So let's move on. Before we do move on, though, I'd like to say that the whole thing about neuromyths, to me, it's all based on fake news a little bit, isn't it? Fake science, something that we're seeing the rise of, especially with the Internet. So we're seeing lots and lots of things, not just about education, but about all things from all walks of life that are great sound, great sounding information with great visuals and great sound bites and great um chunks of information, but it's not actually true. So let's start on our three common neuromyths. But before we do this, I'd like you to answer a question. Oops, no, I wouldn't. I'm just gonna click on my screen, sorry. We only use 10% of our brain. This appeared in the chat box earlier. So someone has obviously done their research, which is great. Um, yeah. I personally love this neuromyth and I love it from a very personal point of view because I like to think, okay, if I only use 10% of my brain, what else could I do? I think it's a fabulous idea. I, I, I think of myself kind of lying in bed or when I'm asleep, only using 10% of my brain and all the possibilities, all the things I could do, all the things I could be if I only used the other 90%. It's a kind of neuromyth that makes me feel really good. It's like I have this reservoir of untapped potential that if only I could find the key to unlock it, I'd suddenly be a lot cleverer. However, okay, it's a neuromyth, unfortunately, even though it sounds great. When I talk about brain function, by the way, or when I talk about the brain, I'm talking about neurotypical brains, okay? The average brain. Um, Claire in her talk earlier talked a lot about um, neurodiversity and we're not actually going to touch on that today. We're talking about the normal, which is the wrong word, or the standard concept of brain function and how it works. So if we look at a, neuro, a neuromyth, why on earth is this a neuromyth? Well, basically, because it doesn't make sense from an evolutionary standpoint. The human body and the brain is incredibly efficient and it's a real wonder of nature. 
So what's the point of having 90% of it inactive at any one time? It simply doesn't make sense from a biological point of view, which is why scientists have started to, uh, to, to question this. So if the body is such a clever instrument, in terms of biology, it would be very, very wasteful to have so much of the brain not working or asleep. No inactive areas of the brain have been observed during MRI and other imaging and mapping techniques. So when we perform most of our tasks every day, including learning, it requires many regions in the brain in both hemispheres, both sides to work together. And this is a very sophisticated parallel thing. The corpus callosum is now being called the information superhighway that joins the left and the right side of the brain. And it's something that's constantly working. Everything is in concert at the same time. So we cannot say that 10% of our brain is asleep. Sorry, 10% of our brain is working and the other 90% is asleep, excuse me. So where's this neuromyth come from? Um, in 1907, William James, who's one of the fathers, or, or rather the godfathers of psychology, he wrote a very important treatise, important theory, in which he said that most people will never achieve 10% of their human potential. That's very different from your brain only using 10% of its capacity, but somewhere along the way, this message has been mistranslated. And as I said before, I think it's quite attractive to think this. However, there is always a kernel of truth, as in there's always a little grain of truth in neuromyths. There's always something that, that, that is real. Imaging techniques do make it possible to measure which brain regions are involved in a mental or physical activity. So yes, certain parts of the brain might seem more active when we do certain things, however, it's really not just 10%. The brain is working all the time, even when they're asleep. Now, marketers and business people love this myth because I think it's a really good way of selling things. It helps to sell vitamins, energy drinks, all kinds of products, all kinds of things that will help to access that missing 90%. My mobile phone, which I have here, is full of apps that promise to make my brain work better, full of brain teasers, full of puzzles, full of games. There are even apps designed to make us even more intelligent, to make us smarter while we sleep. So I think from business point of view, we only use 10% of our brain is a very clever concept. Okay, let's move on to something else. Can you use the chat box, please? And can you tell me or tell the group, do you think you have a particular learning style? That's obviously going to be our next neuromyth. So there's a little bit of a clue there. But do you think that you have a particular learning style? Excuse me a moment. OK, I'm just going to look at a few things in the chat. Okay, ah, uh, I don't think so. That's a great answer. Learning styles are a myth according to science. Okay, some of you are definitely ahead of the game. I'm sure I learn better when I listen to something or someone. I don't think so. Okay, some really interesting comments there. Um, let's move on. Neuromyth two. The neuromyth of learning styles. Again, I'm not going to read aloud from the board. I'm going to try and avoid that as much as possible. Um, as I've mentioned right at the very beginning, one of the things we do know about the brain is the teacher reading aloud to students doesn't always work. So just have a quick look at this and also maybe look at my word cloud. Auditory, visual or kinesthetic or maybe change the letters around and we call it VAC, visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. This is about how people have different learning styles. The learning, the learning styles theory states that people differ in the way that they learn due to some special innate property in their brains. And so we should customize our teaching to students' particular learning style. 
as a primary school teacher, this was something that formed a very big part of my initial training. However, and there's always a however, unfortunately, that's just not true. Learning styles are a neuromyth. There are learning preferences, which is something different, and we'll come to that later. But it's generally accepted that there is no empirical valid evidence that shows that students oops, have a specific learning style. So take a moment to read my um, screen. No empirical valid evidence. So research shows that changing the teaching method to doing everything aud auditorily or visually or kinesthetically, making everything tactile has no impact on student success. There's simply no valid base for it. There is valid research though that tells us that visual, auditory and kinesthetic information is processed in different parts of the brain. However, these brains are connect, th these, um, these structures are very deeply connected and there's a very deep cross-modal activation of transfer of the information in the brain. So we can't say that someone learns something in a visual style, in an auditory style or a kinesthetic style. It's simply not true. Now, it's not true, but why is that important? Does it really matter? Does it matter if I think that my student learns in a tactile way? Does it really matter if I think that my student learns in a visual or an auditory way? Well, at the root of this neuromyth, the VAC, the visual, auditory and kinesthetic neuromyth, is the misconception that each brain develops differently and therefore each child learns differently, obviously. It's true that we're born with 100 billion neurons and every person has a unique network of connections which develops in their brain. However, there is, we have more in common in our brains than we have differences. So development doesn't entirely mean that the brain is predisposed to process information in a dominant modality, in a dominant sense. So I mentioned before that we're talking about neurotypical brains. We discussed earlier, or rather Claire discussed earlier, that you know maybe that's not the right term, but it's the term we have at the moment, so, so we'll go with that. Um, we're talking about non-neurodiverse brains, neurotypical brains. So there's a, they have a lot more in common than we think. I think the main difficulty in talking about the about learning styles or the main disadvantage is the fact that it encourages us to label students. It encourages us to label students and maybe more importantly, it encourages us to label ourselves. And I think this is super important. And those of you who were listening to Claire earlier will, will, will be able to pick up on this. The OECD, remember they're the big research body for mind brain education at the moment, conducted surveys of teachers in 14 countries. They interviewed 12,000 teachers and discovered that 90% of them are convinced that their students have one dominant learning style. X amount of students are visual, X are auditory and X are kinesthetic. So what we're actually doing, the 90% of the 12,000 teachers that answered this survey, we're labeling children on the basis of something that isn't proved. And I personally think that's really, really dangerous for various reasons. But what's more important, I think, and what's more personal is that we label ourselves. How many times have you said to yourself or heard someone say, oh, oh I'm a visual learner? Or how many times have you tr not tried to do something because, oh, I don't learn that way, or I'm no good at it, or it's too difficult? I personally don't like maths, so I'm really, really careful with my own children because I think if I don't like maths, and if I tell my children that maths is hard, that I'm not good at it, oh, yeah, mummy's no good at maths, I'm setting up a negative circle, and I'm perpetuating this negative concept of maths, for example. 
We do the same with grammar when we teach languages. I've observed many, many teachers teaching, and I've been really surprised at the number of teachers that say to students before they begin the lesson, oh, I'm really sorry, it's a grammar lesson today. Or even at the end, oh, sorry about the grammar lesson. Why are we apologizing? Why are we telling students things that just aren't true? Why are we labeling things? One of the statistical reasons, in fact, the biggest reasons why people do not study maths in higher education is because it, it's, it's viewed negatively because people say, oh, I'm no good at maths. So they don't study it because we come to the lesson with such a negative mindset. Before we even start, we're convinced we're going to be no good at it. I think that's really sad. And I think as teachers, it's our job to keep our mouths shut sometimes about what we might think about our students and what they're good at and maybe what they're not good at. Of course, we've said that with every, oops, with every neuromyth, there's a little grain of truth. And yes, learners may personally exhibit preferences for receiving information in a specific mode. Some of the chat box comments I read out earlier, someone said, I prefer to listen. Yeah. I don't prefer to listen, I prefer to write. So when I first started comparing this session, I had so much information I wanted to tell everybody. I had so many things to say that I, I got all my documents and I was cutting and pasting and I was you know, typing and I thought, no, no, Jane, that's no good. The information's not going in my brain. I needed a pen because I personally feel that I have to write things down. I have to write things down because if not, it doesn't seem real to me. But this doesn't mean that science says that I have a particular learning style. What it says is I have a preference. Um, what preferences do you have? Let's have a quick look at the, at the chat box. Okay, some interesting comments here. Totally agree, I like that one. Um, auditory, I don't know. It's, it's, everyone's different. Everyone's different, but we have so much more in common than we think. And as soon as we start saying about children, as soon as we label people and say, oh no, this person learns in this way, this person learns in that way, we do them an incredible disservice, I think. Which brings me to the second, sorry, not the second, I'm very tired, the third neuromyth. Are you a left brain or a right brain learner? Give me your answer in the chat box. I'm very interested what people are saying here. Mm -hmm. Okay. If it's meaningful, it stays in your mind. Exactly. We're going to touch on that later, how we can make learning meaningful. So are you a left brain or a right brain learner? Let's have a quick look at this neuromyth. Again, read the, the screen for yourself, because remember, teachers talking, teachers reading aloud from a whiteboard doesn't help with learning, doesn't help with cognition. Okay, I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna tell you an anecdote. I mean, lots of my talks, lots of my training is actually anecdotal. As I said, I'm not a scientist, so I talk a lot and I talk a lot and I talk about things that I feel, things that I've noticed, things that I've observed. However, unfortunately, I observe the wrong things. Take the example of my son. Okay, I have a son at university, he's studying engineering. Ever since he's a little boy, I've been talking about his left brain. I've been saying to people, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he, he'd make an excellent car mechanic. It's the left side of his brain, you know, the logical side. It's the critical, the logical, the thinking, the problem solving side. He's not good at French or painting because, you know, he's not a, a right brain thinker. What on earth was I talking about? Everything is linked. The science says there is no division between left brain and right brain. The corpus callosum, remember, the information superhighway, it connects everything. When I was a, learned to be a when I first trained to be a primary school teacher, 
we used to study coordination exercises to improve the non-dominant side of the brain. So in order to help my right brain students to activate the more logical, the, you know, the harder side, the more logical thinking side, we were told to put our finger over our right nostril and breathe because in that way, I'm activating the left side of my brain. We also learned great little exercises such as take your right hand and touch your left elbow. Take, take your right left hand and touch your right elbow. All these things are going to help us to activate the opposite sides of our brain. It was great, but it was absolute nonsense. Although having said that, the science does say that quick bursts of aerobic activity in the classroom can really help to give people a brain break. It can help them to refocus. It can wake people up, basically. Get people moving, get the children moving, stand up, sit down, run to the door, push against the walls. Can you make your classroom wall move? Yes or no, that kind of thing. But these are aerobic activities that are basically irrigating the brain. They're not doing anything to uh, help us to um, nurture the other side. A neuromyth, there's no direct scientific e evidence supporting any of this. There's no learning style and there are no thinking style. We don't have the secrets of the universe and our character locked inside a certain part of our brain. It's such an oversimplification. The data shows that the subsystems in both hemispheres are activated for everything. For example, when we read, we're decoding with both sides of the brain, not just the left or not just the right. It's much more complex than that. And for us to simplify things, we do not just our students a disservice, we do ourselves a disservice. So again, the OECD, who are the people to go to if you want information on all the new research, the two brain hemispheres don't work in isolation. Nothing in the brain works in isolation. It all works together. Unless someone has a, particularly part, a particular part of the brain that's damaged or if there's some kind of illness. But for anybody who's neurotypical, and I know that's not the word we should use, but we decided earlier it's the word we have, so we'll continue to use it. Um, everything works together. Nothing, we, we can't split, split things into two. I'm gonna have a quick look at the chat box here to see any interesting comments. Wow, I can see quite a lot of questions there, but let's move on. The latest research. So again, take a moment to read the screen. It's a really, really interesting study, and I've included the link in the handout. I find it absolutely fascinating, basically because it has really made me think about what I do in the classroom and also what I teach teachers to do. Um, there's always a kernel of truth, though. There's always a kernel of truth in everything. So the two hemispheres that we have, the left and the right, they're not identical. Something's obviously going on in each side that's a little bit different, both anatomically and functionally. However, any kind of thinking process or any kind of physical process, it's completely linked. So we really have to stop talking about left brain and like right brain learners because we're not doing anyone any favors. We're just massively oversimplifying things. So what does work? What do we know about the brain? Well. Not that much at the moment, apart from it's incredibly complex and everything is connected. The act of coordination of the human brain is absolutely incredible. Any kind of thinking process takes place in both hemispheres. It doesn't take place in one half. When I'm fixing a car, I don't employ my left brain. And when I'm painting a picture, I don't employ my right brain, both of them. Um, are, are connected at all times. In fact, we can describe it as a concert. So individual players might have a stronger role during certain movements, but there's no one side of the orchestra that's always dominating. And as soon as I grasped that, 
has completely changed the way I think about students, about myself, about people. I love a good online quiz. I love these um, quizzes and puzzles. What kind of thinker are you? What kind of Disney film are you? What kind of mother are you? What kind of X, Y, Z are you? And I love them. And I waste such a lot of time doing these online quizzes. However, it's not based on any kind of fact. So we need to be really careful. What does work? Okay, you must be thinking now, well, tell us what works. There are four main areas of research at the moment in about brain development and cognition. And they tell us that learning is enhanced when there's repetition of material, there's individual attention to a student by a teacher, excitement occurs at the time the material is presented, and students activate what they already know. Now, this might seem commonplace to you. You're probably doing a lot of this already. If you are, well done and keep on doing it because the science supports you. Well, let's look at this in a little bit more detail. Repetition or retrieval practice. We've got to stop putting ideas into children's heads. We've got to pull the information out. This is all about eliciting. This is all about the, the teacher letting the students do something, letting children speak rather than telling them what to say. TTT, if those of you who've ever studied a CELTA course, you'll be very familiar with this concept, teacher talking time. I also, I work as a university lecturer. So, you know, I'm really good at talking. I'm good at talking and telling people what to do. And maybe I should just stop. Maybe I should pull the ideas out of the students rather than trying to cram so much information into their heads. So when we talk about repetition, we're talking about how we recycle material, how we repackage it, how we redo things in the classroom. It can be really frustrating, especially as an English teacher, when you think, how many times have we done the present simple? How many times have we done body parts? And the students still haven't got it. Or, or, or they can't produce it the way we want them to. This is where learning styles might come into play, but not as learning styles, more as a teaching method, make things visual, make things auditory, make things kinesthetic, as many ways as possible of representing and repracticing languages. language. Retrieval practice is very popular at the moment, and retrieval practice is an area of research that talks about these different things that students can generate. So flashcards, the teacher doesn't generate the flashcards, the students make their own flashcards. I'm not talking about a flashcard of a picture of a butterfly and the word, I'm talking more about flashcards as in the way I used to study when I, when I was at university. A card with keywords, that the student focuses on visually, but get the students to produce these. Concept maps as well. So often the teacher shows a concept map. The, the teacher shows a spidergram. The teacher shows a timeline. It's all generated by the teacher. The research shows that if the students produce this, then the information has much more possibility of sticking in their brain. Same for quizzes, same for worksheets, same for white writing prompts. Rather than giving the students things to do, let it come from them. So let them express themselves. Let them tell us what they can do. Because as soon as they do that, we realize what they don't know. So I say to my students, okay, we're gonna, re we're gonna revise science. I want you to prepare a set of flashcards with the really important topic words connected to, I don't know, volcanoes, the water cycle. If my students do that, this is retrieval practice, there is a far higher chance that they will retain the information and be able to produce it, rather than me standing in front of the board and saying, okay, we do this, 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 and this. This is what you should know. So that's retrieval practice. Individual attention to students. I'm sure this is quite obvious. And Elsa earlier in her talk about inclusivity in the, in the class, inclusive, uh, inclusion in the classroom spoke quite a lot about this. How to include all the students. 
the research shows that if a student is gets some one-in-one -one teacher time regularly throughout the academic year, it makes the world of difference. It's really hard though, especially if we work in places where we have very, very big classes. But any time that you can respond to the student personally, any time you can actually sit next to them and accompany them, it doesn't have to be spoken. It just has to be the student being next to the physical space of the teacher. It makes a massive, massive difference to their learning. It focuses their energy, it focuses their attention, and also it helps to minimise distraction. You know, those students who are always sitting at the back of the class, the ones who tend to, you know, misbehave or, or, or we abandon them a little bit in, in, in the lesson, go and sit next to them while they're working. Draw up a chair. If a student's missing, if a student's absent, go and sit on that empty chair, sit next to the students, be on their level and get to know them a little bit. You don't actually have to say anything, but all the research about mind-brain education points towards this being a really, really positive thing. Excitement. Sorry, let me drink water, I'm too excited. Excitement. It sounds superficial, doesn't it? It sounds, um, it, it sounds frivolous, but it's not. Research talks about the novelty switch in the brain. As soon as we hear or see or feel something different or novel, the human being reacts. And we, we react basically at the beginning to see if it's a threat. So something new is in our environment. Oh, is it a wild animal? Is it um, you know another hunter gatherer? This is all primordial. It's very, very primitive, but we process new things in the environment in that way. Dopamine as well in the hippocampus, which has a major, major role in learning and memory. Nobody knew anything about dopamine until the last 20 years. And suddenly it's like, ah, dopamine actually really, really helps people learn. So what we need to do is make things as engaging as possible. I'm not suggesting that we release wild animals into the classroom, and I'm not suggesting that we um, scare our students, but what I am suggesting is that we can keep our teaching as memorable and as personal as possible. And what that actually means is we teach the students, not the material. So often we end up teaching the book. We end up teaching pages in the book, OK, it's the 5th of December. I've got to get to unit three before Christmas. It's really hard sometimes because sometimes we work for institutions and we're really constrained. But teach the students, not the material. You might be wondering about this photo here. It's actually a photo I took. It's my snowflake photo. And as I said, when we began, you know, I'm going to it's another little anecdote. Many, many years ago, more than 30 years ago, I was a primary school teacher in a school in Turkey, and I lived in a city where it never, ever snowed, never snowed. It had never snowed in like 600 years or something like that. So what happened? The day when I was being observed by the school head and also the inspector of schools in the region where I lived in Turkey, guess what happened? It started to snow. I had the most fabulous lesson plan. It was like this. It was in a dossier. I'd even actually had it bound in a spiral. It was beautiful. It completely went out of the window because it started to snow. And I had two options. I could teach the material. I could teach my beautiful lesson plan. Or I could just run to the window with the children and teach the snow, which is basically what we did. Fortunately, I kept my job. Unfortunately, the um, inspector was very understanding and he liked it. But this sounds a very frivolous anecdote. But to me, I mean, more than 30 years of teaching, that was probably one of the most teachable moments of my life. We can't ignore what happens in the classroom. Keep it memorable. Keep it personal. And remember, we're teaching people. We're not teaching brains. We're not teaching learning styles. We're actually teaching, if they're children, we're teaching real people who have so many things to give and so many things to tell us rather than me cramming things into their brain. So this was a really big teachable moment and it was also a really big learning moment for me because I just thought, Jane, you know, all that lesson planning, 
let it go. Teach what happens, respond to what goes on in the classroom. I'm about to finish now. The other main thrust of research at the moment is all about activating prior knowledge. It's all about building new knowledge on the old, and it's all about visible thinking routines. Now, I don't know if you're familiar or not with visible thinking routines. I'm gonna have a really quick look in the chat box. Okay, making thinking visible. I've included some links on the handout. Um, making thinking visible, something really, really simple, like um, think, pair, share. So I have a picture of a, vol of a volcano. You know, everyone knows something about something. Picture of a volcano on the board. I want you to think for one minute, what do you know? I want you to talk to your pair, your partner for two minutes, think pair. And then I want you to share with the class for three minutes. So one, two, three, think pair, share. This is one of the most basic thinking routines we call it visible thinking routines or making thinking visible because it's all about getting the children, because I'm talking about children here, but it can be adults as well, getting them to show what they know because everyone knows something. A bit like the neuro neurodiversity talk earlier, everyone knows something about something and we have to let it out of the children's heads rather than putting information in. A really good thing about um, Think, Pair, Share as well is that the students can help each other. At the initial think stage, okay, I'm alone with my thoughts. I might have a lot to say about volcanoes, but I don't have the words to express it. It doesn't matter. I will talk to my pair, to my partner. They can help me with the words. They can help with the language. Also, what we're doing is we're activating the novelty switch in the brain, and the children are so much more engaged than me telling them about about a volcano or the water cycle or grammar oh I'm sorry kids oh I'm really sorry we're going to do grammar today it's like no we're doing grammar that's fabulous we're going to learn a lot tell me what you know my final visible thinking routine and there are a lot of them is why this is a very simple uh, visible thinking routine and it's called the three whys any ideas why? I'm just checking the chat box. But I'm actually aware that we're running out of time a bit, so I'll move on. What we do with the three whys is we take a topic and we think about why it's important to me, why it's important to my community, and why it's important to the world. Now, Let's take lockdown. Why was lockdown important to me? Okay, lockdown was important to me because I spent four months without leaving this house. It was important to me because I became a Zoom expert. Look at how I can share my screen. And it was also important to me because I spent a lot of time with my two children. They'd say too much time, but I thought it was great. So that's the first why. Why is it important to me? The second why is about why it's important to the community. So lockdown was important to the community because everybody in the supermarkets worked really, really hard. All the delivery people worked really, really hard. Some people unfortunately lost their jobs, but there was one really beautiful thing in my community, which was the grass grew because no one was cutting the grass. The silence as well. I live in an old part of the city, but I can also hear the noise of the motorway. For four months, I didn't hear the motorway at all. It was really quite beautiful. So the first why, why is it important to me? The second, why is it important to the community? And then why was lockdown important to the world? Obviously, we haven't got time to go into all this, but this is a really basic thinking routine. And all the research, remember the OECD, other people to, 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 to count on uh, for, for reliable research on the brain. They're saying that this is how the brain works. The brain doesn't work by 
putting things in, it works by letting things out and everyone knows something about something. And the three whys is a really, really valuable teaching tool, not just for languages, but for any kind of science, history, geography, social studies. Okay, as you can see, my TTT is very high. So, oops, something's happened to my, uh, okay. Let's go back to my four questions. Not everybody did this because some people signed up a little bit later for the seminar, but I asked you these four questions in the pre-webinar task. As you can see, all four of these neuro myths are false. There's a grain of truth in everything, remember. There's always a grain of truth somewhere. But I think it's our job as teachers to be a little bit skeptical. You must have been listening to what I've been saying about left brain, right brain and learning styles and thinking, that's wrong. That's wrong because in my experience, in my classroom, I think it's really, really difficult being a teacher and dealing with the science sometimes because so much of what I do in the classroom or so much of what we do in the classroom, we do it because it feels right. We have this kind of intuition. It, it comes from the brain or maybe it also comes from the stomach. It's a kind of visceral thing when we teach. We think this works. I don't know why, but it works. What's really important, I think, and I will finish now, I promise, is that you're all here listening to one, two or three seminars, which are all about the theme of inclusion, neurodiversity, and how the brain does or doesn't work. The fact that you're all here, I think, is absolutely fabulous because it shows that you're not like me. You're not stuck in 35-year-old teaching habits. It hasn't taken an epiphany for you to come here. You're thinking, oh, okay, I'll take that from here and I'll take this from here. The most important thing is that we question things. Anyway, I'm all talked out now. Melissa, shall I unshare my screen? Hi, Jane. Yeah, thank you so, so much. Um, that was great. Don't don't worry about the time. We were <laughs> avidly, completely captivated and, and listening. But it's also great that we've got time for questions. So if anyone else has a question for Jane, um, put it in the comments if you're watching on Facebook or... No, chat. no scientific questions, please. No parts of the brain questions. I, I, I can't do that. Yeah, I mean, let's let's use our time with Jane here to talk about her teaching experience and and um, and what she's learned and 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 of course, if somebody wants to know a bit know a bit more about the myths we've already talked about, we can go back and and help with that. But but yeah, um, as Jane said, she doesn't claim to be a a, a neuroscientist, so. <laughs> we'll keep it quite light but I learned loads Jane absolutely loads um I I have to admit that I think I was taught those all of those things as well when I was training to be a teacher in mm -hmm. courses um it's incredible I did a I did a whole course on 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 brain exercises which is breathe through this nostril touch your toes and these kind of activities they do work they do they work because they provide um, aerobic exercise and it's a change of focus and it's a change of pace and it's very motivating but it doesn't kick start the other half of your brain so I think we have to be realistic about what we about what we say to to yeah. our teachers and to ourselves yeah yeah definitely okay well let's take a look in the in the question and answer area to see what we've we've got um <clears throat> uh, so there's there's one question that's quite long, so I'm going to kind of summarise it a bit. It's from uh, Chaima. Uh, Chaima, I hope I'm pronouncing your name wrong. And she she says, do you know if there's any difference um, between adults and, and children when it comes to talk about learning styles or, or learning preferences? Or is the research, is it a myth for all, all age groups? Well, there's been... Okay, there's the three year learning um, theory, which is all about how the, the brain is incredibly plastic before the age of three, which it is. But the brain doesn't lose that much rigid rigidity be between um, early childhood and retirement age, for example. What tends to happen is that the brain stops being plastic 
stops being abs um, stops absorbing information when people retire when they stop working and I think that's like kind of a really big clue there isn't it once you maybe stop working and you stop learning and you stop engaging with people and things and ideas that's what makes our brain more rigid this is the theory there's a big polemic about this and like I say I'm really not a scientist but everything I'm reading all the research that's coming out of reputable sources that's what they're saying I'm not saying that you can learn everything at any age because there are other things into play for example Older people who can't learn languages or have trouble learning languages, the idea of that is supposed to be, it's nothing to do with the brain, it's actually to do with the hearing channels, it's to do with becoming deaf, basically. Okay. That's the research that's coming out a lot anyway. Yeah, I've read a bit about the, uh, the, like the critical period. It's not really true that children can learn languages like sponges but adults can't because we can yeah. right like we, we're learning languages i'm sure all of us here yeah, are teachers yeah. with so many individual differences um and chima what another way to think of it is that uh yeah we want our children to learn in lots of different ways to experience all different activities in the classroom that's what you you kind of wanted to highlight as well jane didn't you because when we're adults we tend to learn or we tend to teach our adults in a very um in a very rigid way you know listen repeat read and write when really maybe we do need to get them up and down around the classroom singing and dancing and i think this is where vac comes in vak visual um auditory and kinesthetic i think it actually comes into play here not as a learning style but as a teaching method mm -hmm. yeah no that that's that sounds that sounds sensible um Let's take a look and see if there's anything else that we think to be interesting. A couple of questions are asking you to think and draw on all your experience. Um, one of them asks about big classes and that, that teacher asks, if we have more than 25 students, how can we give individual attention to them in a 45 minute session? Because you said that individual attention is something that can aid learning. Yeah. Do you have any tips for big classes? Okay, I think it's really, really tough. And I'm a primary school teacher and I have worked in, in classes where I've had 45, three to six year olds. It's been really, really tough. So the research I'm reading at the moment is telling me that can not doesn't just have to be speaking time it can be physical time it's like what I was saying about the empty chair a student's absence from the class so I will go and sit down in that chair and I will teach from that chair do you see what I mean so I'm actually teaching next to a student who I might normally not sit next to rather than me standing at the front because so much of teaching and learning involves the teacher standing at the front and like I say, cramming all the ideas in students' brain, whereas, you know, sit down, teacher, sit next to the student, and the physical, the physical proximity, I mean, you know, we don't, we don't touch the students, but the fact that you're physically at their side, it makes learning more of, you're accompanying the student in the learning, you're actually, you're actually with them, and, you know, it sounds a superficial thing, but it's, it's not, yeah, you know, I, I must admit, because, I only started to research all this when I started to teach didactics and and I was convinced of, of a lot of things, but I've really changed. And, you know, if at my age, your brain is plastic enough to take on new ideas, I think, you know, the world's, there's, there's no limit really, is there? The world's our oyster. Oh, Sorry, a bit off topic there. <laughs> no, but it, it's actually connected to another question that I can see. And it's about, you know, uh, big classes and and how you spend your time talking uh, and uh, it's from uh, Sharzad and Sharzad asks how can we decrease PTT teacher talking time and increase student talking time when we're teaching grammar to students because you did you started talking about that and you didn't recommend just talking at them so any any tips? But, but there's there's uh, there's a way of teaching grammar and it, it does appear more and more often in in books and it's called guided discovery and guided discovery is basically when we give the students a set of rules and they just do the work so if we're teaching grammar okay the way I was taught grammar when I learned French which is the reason why my French was so terrible for so long until I had a real reason for speaking French 
The reason why my French is so was so terrible was that the teacher stood at the front and said, today, present perfect, here's the form. This is what it means, go away and do some exercises. Whereas guided discovery of grammar gives the students a text. It asks the students to highlight, to notice grammar. We pull the grammar out. The students are given questions. They tell us the answers. And the teacher basically guides the students. It's very, very diff different, very different. It's much more interactive. And it really involves the student's cognition at a deeper level. It's like me reading aloud from the board. Quite often, a lot of our teaching is the students listening and taking notes or not taking notes while the teacher's talking. So I'm writing things on the board and I'm writing the same things I've written on the board for the last 35 years, when really I should say, no, let the students do the work because that's the only way they're going to learn by being more engaged and participative in the class. Yeah, and an, an active classroom, great for the yeah. students, great for the, the teacher as well to see yeah. the students being active, isn't it? Um, we have lots of thank yous coming in the chat and the comments, and uh, I'm looking at the time, and I, I think we'll have to, I'll have oh. to say thank you too, because we're, we're coming to the end of our time. Thanks so much for coming, Jane. Everyone You're should very welcome. take a look at the comments uh, and the chat, because there is a handout um, that Jane has, has made for everyone to, to take okay. away the main points of today and some links to if you want to read the research that she's been reading. So thank you everyone for all your participation. I can see that some of you have come to three of our webinars today on inclusion with Elsa O'Brien, um, on neurodiversity with Claire Hart, and then on neuromyths with Jane Delaney. So thank you uh, from, for, from everyone here, from me and Joe, um, and from everyone working on the Facebook team, when, which has been Karen, we am and Marcus. Thanks everyone. Uh, we'll be back in January, January the 18th with the next mini webinar event about technology. So stay okay. tuned and take a look at our website for that. Bye Jane, have a great day. Thank you. Merry Christmas everybody. Thank you. If you celebrate it, if you don't, hope you have a holiday. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.